things that are of interest in the world that um that got my attention and uh and so actually before i forget, begin though i want to say hello i don't want to be rude zakia ali I, I see you in there good to see you uh levon hawkins and anthony ruffin and let's see magazine i see you in here uh let's see uh sharon good morning to you too learning a new financial term every day good for you good for you claudia melissa lashonda uh let's see who else do i see in here uh let me scroll down a little bit and uh it says hi how as many people like michael watkins uh tequila bush good to see you eileen nelson sharon uh pb elliott henry irving irvin uh james keller pat pat butler uh cheryl ashley angela mckinney good to see everybody so good to see you all right so um so let's uh let's just jump right in and uh start our our lives off on the right foot Uh, so, so today, I, what was on my mind in terms of reflections um, is uh, financial insecurity, and we've talked about that a little bit. Uh, in case you guys don't know, uh, we do have a financial therapy department in the Black Business School. It's the first ever Black financial therapy department that we've ever seen anywhere. And uh, this was just an idea that came to us because we realized that the that that our people need healing, right? That there is a lot of pain. That comes with the experiences that you've had. Uh, there's a lot of pain that comes with what's happened in some of your families. Uh, there's a lot of pain that comes with uh, the stress that you experience on the job. Uh, there's a lot of pain that comes from you know living in a, in a competitive capitalist society where nobody left you an inheritance, nobody ever bought you any real estate, nobody ever gave you any of the basic things you need. And and where we're going with this is we want to <clears throat> make this such a common idea that people will literally think of, you know, not le not giving your children assets as the same as not giving them food, right? Uh, you can't imagine any parent that loves their child to raise their child and say, I'm never going to feed this baby. I'm never going to give this baby any food. Well, then you expect the child to not be healthy. You expect the child to die. So ultimately, uh, many of us, unfortunately, rather than experiencing a physical death, Uh, we see uh, other kinds of death. We see the death of our dreams. Uh, you know, all those dreams, all those visions of great things you could have done if you were financially secure. Those dreams don't become real because uh, because you uh, because nobody ever supported those dreams. Nobody ever gave you the capital to support those dreams or uh, or maybe the death of us spiritually. Right. Uh, well, I'm going to show you guys or a little bit later on today how uh, financial insecurity has a huge direct connection with anxiety and depression, which my wife, as you know, my wife is a licensed therapist and a full professor of social work. And she says that anxiety, two things that she said that were really interesting is number one, she said anxiety and depression tend to go together. Typically when, when, when a person has anxiety, they have depression. If they have depression, they have anxiety. And number two is black people have it all over the place. Like we really have like a big problem with anxiety and depression in our community. We, we really get our butts kicked uh, financially and otherwise And it, it's really, really painful to uh, sort of have that Black experience and the mental health impact of, of just the common Black experience is massive. And we tend to ignore that. Uh, we tend to ignore our own pain. Other people ignore our pain. So anyway, um, give me one second here. Um, one second. And by the way, uh, if you uh, if you want to get the recordings of all the trainings we've done to this point, just go to drboyceelevate.com. That's drboyceelevate.com. All the record, all the trainings, all the slides, everything is yours for life. You can share it with your family, anybody you want. Uh, and uh, I think the regular price is $2.99. You can get it for $1.19 right now if you go to drboyceelevate.com. So give me one second here. Um, so, so, um, all right. So, so one of the things I want to talk about is uh, is financial insecurity and not so much the symptoms of it, right? Because we're going to get to that too, like what, what that even looks like, but also just um, the effects of it and uh, the, the mental and physical health effects. Like like literally uh, financial insecurity literally kills you. It, it, it literally, you know, all the things that it does to your mind and your body uh, causes, people, causes people to die earlier. And uh, and so one of the things I want to impress upon you is that, you know, if, if you have, you know, children, nieces, nephews, grandchildren, uh, remember, you don't have to be a parent. You don't have to have a child in order to be a parent. Uh, if you have people you care about, you really want to protect them from this just the same way you would protect them from a virus or an STD or something like that. And um, and 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 so actually, though, I'm going to do something a little bit even, even more awkward. And I'm actually going to start off with with a video. of something that uh, that I just saw today on Twitter that made me really think about the Black experience in America. Uh, does anybody, how many of y'all old enough to remember 
the OJ trial and how you felt on the day of the OJ trial. Give me a yes in the chat. It, how many OGs we got in here? Because uh, there was this young kid who who literally shared the video of the reactions of the public to the OJ trial. And he said, was it really like this? Was it really this lit when it happened? And I know it was. I remember that day. I, everybody I almost. And not only I want to ask you this, not only do uh, I want to ask you, do you remember the OJ trial? But do you remember where you were at the moment the tri the verdict was announced? How many of you remember exactly where you were when they said guilty or when they said not guilty? Hey, how, anybody remember that? Yeah, it, it was so crazy. So let me play this clip and then give me a guess. Uh, yes, uh, let me know if you can uh, hear this audio, okay? I'm going to play this clip. And then there is a point behind this because, as you know, uh, every story has a point. Every point has might have a story. So here, here we go. Let's play this. Superior Court of California, County of Los Angeles, in the matter of the people of the state of California versus Orenthal James Simpson, case number BA097211. We, the jury in the above entitled action, find the defendant, Orenthal James Simpson, not guilty of the penal court section 187. The black people are crazy. The horses are getting scared. <laughs> <laughs> all right so uh you I, I assume you were able to hear the video okay uh were you all able to hear that um it, it was crazy right did you see did you did you see the contrast in the reactions right um it, it was it was absolutely crazy to watch and uh the reason that it's interesting to me uh, and at that time, I was in college and I was writing these articles about race and stuff like that at the University of Kentucky. And what that experience told me is it really highlighted, in my in my view, the contrast between the black experience in America and the white experience in America. It, it just it just reminded you that we see the world very differently. And what's really crazy is that I actually thought OJ did it. But I thought he should have been acquitted. I wanted him to be acquitted because the evidence, in my view, did not support the idea that he committed this crime. It's not what you know. It's what you can prove. Right. That's the way the system is supposed to work. That was my personal opinion. Not to say you have to agree at all. You don't. It's fine. Um, but it really highlighted the, the vast divide in America in terms of experience and perception. And so. Even after the OJ trial, right, a little bit later, you had the Rodney King situation happen. Uh, you've had continuous debates and back and forth about diversity, equity and inclusion, affirmative action, uh, various political issues, things like that. And the divide is still pretty strong. It's still pretty prominent. And and the way we view the world, our experience in this world is is just deeply divided. It's, it's deep, deep, there's a contrast there. There's a massive contrast. So with this massive contrast, what it says to me is is it, it speaks to what drives this divide. What drives this this differential? Well, a big part of what drives this divide is economic racism, right? Economic racism in the sense that uh, not only was a lot of wealth taken from the black community, but black people were not allowed to build wealth uh, in the world. And then when they built wealth, that wealth was taken back. And then once the wealth was accumulated by another group of people, they locked the wealth up. They created economic racism, which is one of the worst forms of racism that there is, because it translates into other forms of, of racial, uh, racially unequal outcomes, like horrible schools, terrible neighborhoods, broken families, things like that. And, uh, and, and, and so what really, and the reason I brought Malcolm with me today 
is because uh, even though we had King Day yesterday, um, I speculate that King, who died as a very young man, was leaning toward the direction of Malcolm. He was having his, his uh, you know, Malcolm went from being Detroit Red to Malcolm X. I think Dr. King was having his own kind of a Detroit Red moment, just in a different way, where he was going from being the guy who sort of fought for social justice to becoming a guy who talked about economic justice, right? He started really talking about the money, really talking about the economics, really talking about the reparations. And I think this is where if King had lived, they, they should make a movie. Like, what if Dr. King had lived? Like, live out the next 40 years of his life. I would love to make that movie. As soon as they pay me my reparations, maybe that'll be a film project I take on. Uh, where, where we could see what Dr. King would have pursued if he lived to the age of 50, 60, 70, 80 years old. I think he would have aligned with a lot of what we talk about in terms of addressing the economic racism as a fundamental pro a fundamental reason for this vast divide. Uh, because here's the thing, when you're talking about the, uh, the misallocation of resources, I don't really believe, and maybe people think I'm silly for thinking this, but I don't believe every, every white person wakes up thinking about how can I be racist today? How can I just make the life of a black person miserable today? I don't think they're really thinking about that. I think they're thinking, that they're living their life according to their values and, and their perception and their worldview. And if, if, if they're doing things, you know, according to their rules and, and, and their values, and they have all the wealth and all the power, well, then all of us are going to have to go in that same direction, right? It's like, if I'm in a car with you um, and, and you say, look, boys, I don't, I don't have anything against you. Um, I, I believe in being fair to everybody, but every Sunday our family goes to church. And uh, if you want to ride in this car, you have to go to church with us. You, you, we're not taking you anywhere else, right? And so let's say that I say, well, you know, maybe I don't want to go to church. I might want to go to the football game because I'm a Indianapolis Colts fan, right? It doesn't matter if I want to go to the football game. The family, we're going to church, you know, not because they hate me, not because they're trying to oppress me, but because they're trying to just express themselves, you know? And, uh, and so sometimes I think, you know, what might be seen as uh, black oppression is really just almost like white expression. You know, they, they sort of because when you have the money and you have the power, you get to implement your worldview. You get to see the world in your way and you get to execute your worldview. And this is why the OJ trial was so significant for black people, because I truly believe that there were white people who said, well, we're white and we control this system. We're the boss. What we want should be what matters. And, and that's really to some extent what they implemented. Even after the trial was over, if you recall, for the next 30 years, they treated OJ as if he committed the crime. It, it's crazy. 30 years later, he, this guy's on Twitter and he's he's doing a few other things now. He's on a couple of sports shows and he still goes places and people say, you killed that lady. Right. And uh, and so so this is this is, to me expresses the necessity for uh, for independent or almost like a almost nationalistic mindset when it comes to what it means to build wealth. If you're in a car and the person keeps driving you to places you don't want to go, your only solution is to get your own car or get your own ride. That's the only solution. You, you can't sit in the car with somebody who's determined to go to church and say, well, I want to go to the football game. They're not going to listen to you. They're going to think you're a bad person for wanting to go to the football game. So, so if you want to go in the direction you want to go, you're going to have to have your own vehicle, and that requires work. That requires planning. That requires preparation. Uh, it, it goes back to that wealth conversation. Wealth is uh, it, it's, it's something that is strategically planned over a long period of time because wealth is simply an accumulation process where you build that capital base. There's that term again. We talked about capital bases yesterday. right? You build that capital base. That then gives you the the vehicle. That's what they call them, financial vehicles, right? Or investment vehicles. You get this vehicle that allows you to travel where you want to go. Do you understand? You know, it took me 15 years to build over one point something million subscribers on different YouTube channels and hundreds of thousands of people on my email list and everything else. Because basically I was building a car. I was building a vehicle. I, I had a worldview. I have a perspective. And, and I wanted to have a a vehicle that allowed me to express myself in a way that wasn't going to be undermined by anybody else. So I said, okay, let, let's just start the work. Let's start digging it out. So I started off with one subscriber, then 10, then a hundred, then a thousand, then 10,000, then it becomes a hundred thousand and a quarter million. And, and it was a consistent accumulation process over 15, 16 years, making literally 22,000 YouTube videos 
that led to the accumulation of just enough power for me to impact the part of the world that I care about. It's not enough to change the world. I'm not, I don't think I'm ever going to change the entire world. I don't want to change the entire world. I don't care about changing the entire world, but I do care about having an impact on the world that matters to me. And you're in my world. We're in the same world together. So my goal is to say, let's build these vehicles so we can create the reality we want to see. And you cannot do that without wealth. You cannot do that without wealth because in America, this capitalist society, the, the group or the people that pay the bills are the ones who make the rules. He who has the gold makes the rules. Let me know if you understand this. Can we commit to this idea? He who has the gold makes the rules. So whenever you see a celebrity like Taraji P. Henson complain, I'm not getting paid enough. He who has the gold makes the rules. Another actor, Terrence Howard, is suing because he wasn't getting paid enough. Well, he who has the gold makes the rules. Uh, you, you've seen other scenarios where people are upset. We're mad, I'm mad at my job or I'm mad about the world or whatever. Well, he who has the gold makes the rules. So the question is, can you acquire the gold? And then when you get the gold, you can make the rules. All right. So uh, and if you don't have the gold, then what happens is you become a target of the bullying and victimization of the people who do control the resources. Do you understand? And this is where your financial anxiety and financial depression and all the things that we're seeing uh, from so many of our people, this is where that comes into play. So let me um, let me hop into our day 17 reflection. Uh, hit the thumbs up button. Uh, also, uh, if you want to get um, some of the material uh, that I want to send out on stocks and stuff like that, just text the word stock to 87948. Text stock to 87948. All right, so let me uh, share my screen really quick. Give me a second here. I'm hitting the wrong button. So sorry. Okay, here we go. All right, button is hit. I think this is the right one. Okay, so let's talk about financial security. All right, so if you, uh, so so what I want you to reflect on is this. I want you to reflect on how you feel when you are financially secure. I want you to just sort of write and in, in, write, you write this in, in your reflective journal. Um, the book is 30 Days to Wealth and Power. It's a workbook. You can get a copy at drboycebooks.com, drboycebooks.com. And I want you to just reflect. I want you to write for maybe give yourself like a five minute time limit and just write and just write down words that describe how you feel when you feel financially secure, when all the bills are paid, when there's plenty of money in the bank. Uh, maybe uh, maybe you feel more confident. Maybe you feel relaxed. Maybe you feel um, fulfilled. Maybe you feel uh, just just happy. Right. And then I want you to also reflect on how you feel when you're financially insecure, when your money's low. Imagine meditate on this idea, med meditate on having you know n a negative bank balance and bills coming due and the kids need you know shoes for school. And your, your wife is telling you that we got to go get the roof fixed. And uh, and your boss is telling you that we're going to let you go next week. Right. Just imagine like I want you to compare and contrast those feelings. So you can kind of really get in tune with how your financial security is connected to where you are emotionally and, uh, it's, and then where you are emotionally is connected to where you are physically. And so this is why black people tend to have a higher instances of hypertension and high blood pressure and and obesity, diabetes, things like that, because a lot of these uh, these physical reactions are either uh, are either physical manifestations of an emotional reaction or they are the result of coping mechanisms to deal with the stress that comes with the challenges of being economically black in America. When you're economically black in America, it's just kind of a hard experience because even if you're the person who makes more money than other people, you've got everybody tugging on you, everybody pulling on you, everybody expecting you to come through for them. That right there becomes a burden as well. And so, uh, so the coping mechanisms might be, for example, for a lot of men, it might come in the form of um, irresponsible sexual behavior, uh, drug use, alcohol consumption, ex excessive alcohol consumption, or maybe even a gambling addiction, right? Just little things to help you feel better. Uh, in other cases, it might come up as, as um, maybe an addiction to food, right? You just, you, you eat some ice cream or a candy bar or whatever, because you, you're so stressed out. And the, the, the hormones that get released when you take a bite in that chocolate bar help you feel better about the world, about the universe for that particular moment. So you see a lot of us walking around, you know, with some extra pounds on our body, right? So being in tune with that and understanding that, um, and then understanding how your financial health is connected to your physical health, maybe that will lead you to see that link between uh, going to the gym and getting your money right, right? Like, like they work together. Uh, when I go to the gym, that gives me 
the physical strength. And that's, that's a habit I, I formed. My wife goes to that boot camp every morning at 5 a.m. I said, I'm not going to no boot camp because I ain't having some, some white lady telling me what to do. Uh, however, I drop her off at boot camp and then I go to do my workout. I don't do much. You know what I do? I just do I just do more than I than I might normally do on a regular day. I do enough to make myself tired. So literally you can work out just by jumping up and down and doing jumping jacks in, in your living room. Just something that will get you sweating. Uh, give yourself a, a time limit, 15, 20 minutes, and say for 20 minutes, I'm just from it's from 1040 to 11 a.m. I'm going to just fit, dedicate that time to watching my favorite TV show and jumping around my apartment, jumping around my living room, right? If you do that, what that does is that just gets your day started off right. I do that most mornings when I get up. And uh, and then what that does is that then gives me time to kind of think about what I'm trying to do from a business or financial standpoint. And then I I dive into the business and I'm feeling like a warrior. I'm, I'm, I've been lifting weights. I've been, I've been, I did a few sit-ups. I, I read, and again, I'm not, I'm not a workout expert. I am not trying to become Arnold Schwarzenegger. I'm not trying to win a bodybuilding competition, but just going in there, there's something that just where the two are just connected, right? So I would encourage you to really think carefully about that connection between your financial fitness and your physical fitness. And if you can link the two, then maybe you get together with an accountability partner and you do you do a little bit of both. Like we just want to, we're going to talk about where we can get financially stronger, but we're also going to go to the gym together or we're going to go jog together. We're going to go for a walk together. We're going to just do something, right? Uh, and so, so these things are deeply connected. So let me show you the effects of financial insecurity and what that kind of does to your mindset. A lot of a lot of us may know these things, but I don't know if we reflect on these things. We don't reflect on the fact that that the racial wealth gap impacts you in several ways that go far deeper than the money. The money is just the 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 the, the simple impact. Like that's the easy spot. That's the easy thing to see. It's easy to see how having less money means you you'll have less money. That that's that's not hard to calculate. But what isn't discussed are things like this. Um anxiety and stress. If you have financial worries, you're just stressed out. Like let me know if you know what I'm talking about. When you are worried about money, you just it's, you're not comfortable. Right? And and I want you to think about it for yourself but also for your children too or people you care about. When when you would you help them out financially, when you do things like the $5 a day plan, you're not just giving them money. You're giving them peace of mind. You're giving them happiness. You're giving them freedom. Uh, a lack of freedom is the direct link to uh, depression. Uh, the studies show that when they study rats in the lab, and they they can measure how depressed a rat is by by the serotonin in the rat's brain. And what they found was that rats that were trapped, that were in the trap, that couldn't uh, change their situation, that were enduring electrical shocks and pain, and could not fix. Their situation could not get out, did not have the skills to get out, did not have the tools or the opportunity to get out. They ended up depressed. They were more depressed than the rats who had a solution. So I need you to think about meditate on this for a moment because I'm thinking about a couple things. Number one, I think about like all this music they in hip hop. They call it trap music, like growing up in the trap. And, and I just I think that's interesting. I, there's nothing good about being in the trap. That doesn't make sense to me. But then the other piece of that, too, is. So think about this. This means that if I have a child or a grandchild or a nephew or a niece or a kid that I care about and I want them to be happier, then I can I either a help them get the resources to, to free themselves from financial challenges and then B, I give them skills that will help them get out of the trap. I, I, I put them in situations where they can be problem solvers. Do you understand? And I, and then I want you to contrast and I want you to meditate on this. And I want you to compare this to the culture. When when we have a problem, do we get together and solve the problem or do we get together and whine and complain about the problem? You know, do we get together and and say let's form a proactive solution so we can be prepared to eliminate the problem from a long-term perspective? Or do we get together and say, "Man, that ain't right." White people, they always be doing this to us. Isn't it? Let's hold a march. Let's hold a rally. Al Sharpton's holding a march next week. We're going to go to the march and, and, and march five miles and then go home and do nothing. That That's what it's a pit. It, it, we do have the pity parties. And, I, and I'm not saying that that these marches and rallies can never have value, but I'm saying that you got to have a strategy. You got to have a plan. You got to execute on something. You have to do something. You know, so so ultimately, going back to that rat study, 
rats that don't have a plan, rats that don't have the skill, rats that don't have an out are the rats that become depressed. Humans that don't have a skill, humans that don't have a plan, humans that don't have an out become the humans that are depressed. Do you see the connection there? Do you understand? Let me know. I, I'm, 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 I, I wanna, I'm meditating on this because I really need us to really get this. We, you know, and, and, and the more skill you have, the better, the more plans you can come up with. It's like basketball. The better of a basketball player I am, the more ways I can put the ball in the basket. Kobe Bryant and Michael Jordan and LeBron James were were um are, are and are, were and are amazing athletes because they just had a million different ways to get to the basket. You couldn't stop Kobe from scoring because Kobe Kobe was going to. If you if you stopped him from lay, doing a layup, he would shoot a jump shot. If you stopped his jump shot, he would do a layup. If you stopped his layup and his jump shot, he would shoot a three pointer. Right? He, you know that th you can't stop these players. Why? Well, because somebody trained them to have all different kinds of solutions to deal with different kinds of defenses. And so, so to me, to me, this thing we call racism, white supremacy, all these other things. That's just like defense. That's defense that's stopping me from putting the ball into the basket. That, But I got to put that ball in that basket because I got to feed my family. I got to find a way to make a way. I got to find a way to make this work. And if you show up at the big game called economic warfare, if you show up to the big game and you're trying to put the ball in the basket and you've only got one move, you're never going to score. There's no basketball player ever that's ever been a great player that only had one move. Ever. You name one player ever in the history of the NBA who has had a great career who had one move. Players like that don't last very long. They can't succeed. They don't score any points. So, so for black people, when you're talking about making your money, when your children are talking about making their money, the problem that we have is that our kids only have one move. Where's the jobs at? I'm going to fill out a job application. I got my college degree now. That's Is that the only move you got? So then what happens is that when I, you know, like I, there was a young man I used to mentor and I would call him. I, I remember calling him. He had a newborn baby. And he said, I said, uh, so how, how are things going with the baby? He said, oh, it's fine. I said, I said, are you you're doing your job? You're taking care of your child and stuff like that. He said, well, it's kind of hard. I said, well, what's going on? He said, he said, well, you know, the white man ain't hiring. And I said, man, don't you ever say that pathetic stuff to me ever again. I said, you have a child that looks up to you. You have a child that is depending on you. You can't go to your child and say, well, the reason you can't eat is because the white man won't let you eat today. That makes him the alpha. That makes you the beta. That means you're you're almost like his child now. They, you might as well call him daddy. I can't. Well, I can't feed you, son, because because your real daddy won't let you eat. Won't go give me no food to feed you. That that that's that that's embarrassing. That's sad. That's pathetic, and it's terrible because that's how we're raised. You have to have multiple moves. It doesn't require a complicated strategy. It might just be basic rules we have in the black business school, the threefold. One, every black child should own shares of stock from the day that they're born. If you buy them stock consistently from the time they're born, they're going to have so much money by the time they get to their 20s. They'll never have to work for anyone for their entire life if they don't want to. First thing. Number two. Every black child in the community should understand the value of ownership of real estate versus renting. Renting should be seen as temporary. Ownership is permanent. They should own property as soon as possible. As soon as they become owners of real estate, the sooner their wealth starts to grow. Number three, every child in our community should know how to start a business by the age of 12. They don't have to be a full-time entrepreneur, but they should understand where businesses come from so that in case they run into a situation where they need a plan B, need a side hustle for extra income, or just decide they want to get off the corporate plantation, they will always have the ability to bounce on out and do what they want to do. Those are three basic rules that you can apply to your kids, grandkids, nieces, nephews, the kids in your community, you don't have to have a child in order to be a parent. A lot of our children need parents because their real parents are are horrible. Y'all know what I'm talking about. I adopted kids because 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 their fathers weren't quite there the way they should have been. But I took them under my wing. So at the end of the day, this is the plan, people. This is what you have to do. If you do that, any child who's had that kind of exposure, who's been who knows as much about starting a business as they know how to play basketball, play football, rap, and go to dance class and or cheerleading camps and all this. Any kid that knows 
business as well as he knows basketball or football is never going to run out of moves. They're always going to have options. They're going to see money everywhere. So I'm going to repeat the three rules one more time, and then we're going to move on. Number one, every child should own stock from the time that they're born. Number two, every child should understand the difference between owning real estate and renting real estate. Renting should be seen as temporary because we're not trying to just go make a bunch of landlords rich. Number three, every child should know how to start a business by the age of 12. If you do that, then your kids are going to, they're going to fly. They're going to soar. They're not going to go, go through life constantly complaining about what white people won't let them do. That, that, that's not the language. That's not empowered language right there. That's not the language of free people. That's not freedom language. That's slave language. That's slave talk. All right. So let me, let's, let's, let's go back to these slides here. So here's some effects of financial insecurity, anxiety, and stress. Number two, <clears throat> depression, uh, prolonged financial struggles can cause feelings of hopelessness. Depression is big. There's a lot of depression in the community. There's a lot of suicide in the community. The reason you don't see the suicide is because it doesn't appear as somebody simply taking their own life. It's suddenly, it, it's slow suicide. It's it's uh, doing things that put you in harm's way, things that can get you killed, being irresponsible in the streets, being irresponsible with sex, making irresponsible choices, eating horrible food that's going to kill you and give you cancer. They, those are the types of, that. those are the ways that people take their own lives that I've noticed. Uh, Tupac Shakur had a great line in his song, Only God Can Judge Me, where he said, no more hesitation, each and every black male's trapped. And they wonder why we're suicidal running around strapped. So notice the word trapped. There's that word trapped again. Each and every black male's trapped. So because you're trapped, you're and, and they wonder why we're suicidal running around strapped. So basically in that song, he said exactly what I said to you. Being trapped leads to depression and anxiety, which can lead to worse outcomes than that. So if you want your kids to have a healthy life and your grandkids and great grandkids and everybody else, then you um, you make sure they're not trapped. That's it. Just I, I, you're, you're going to be free. So anxiety, stress, depression, <clears throat> relationship strain, uh, money issues often strain personal and family relationships. When money is scarce, wars tend to ignite. The reason Europeans uh, were some of the craziest people on earth. I mean, it, it was weird to me. I, when I watch World War II footage, it freaks me out because it's amazing to see white people working that hard to kill other white people and building bombs to like blow each other up like they're subhuman. Like, because I because I don't know about y'all, but I, I look and I see a, if I see a German, I don't see the much difference in a German pr person and a French person and a British person and an Italian person. Right. Like they're all kind of from the same continent. But yet you're all like, I'm going to kill him. It's crazy. Right. And, and so so part of that warfare, in my opinion, came from just scarce resources. OK, there isn't enough for everybody. So we're going to fight for it. And, uh, and so a lot of times when you have scarcity, um, then you, you can have conflict over scarce resources. The number one or number one or number two, depending on which study you look at, reason for divorce is money. A lot of you already know that. Uh, and uh, also when you are in a family situation, when there's not enough money, it, it can cause a strain between the parents, which can ultimately lead to the breakup of the family, because maybe the father says, you know what, this is too hard. I'm out of here. You know, or the mother says, you're not making enough money or there's not enough money coming into the house. I could be broke by myself. You, We've seen all these situations. Right. So money issues can cause relationship strain. So <clears throat> by training your child how, on how to make enough money, they're at least giving their marriage, like th their partner, one less thing for them to argue about. Right. There's there's plenty of money. So we're going to argue about something else, but it won't be money because we have enough. Right. Next, impaired decision making. Uh, the stress can affect your cognitive functions, leading to poor decisions. So you're stressed out about money. So you make bad choices. How many people are in the penitentiary right now? Good, smart, decent human beings, otherwise decent people are in prison right now because of financial stress. I saw this uh, YouTube video yesterday about the Somali pirates. And I. I and, and how they have all these European ships going through the Suez Canal and the Somali par pirates, you know, were basically robbing the ships. I think they're still doing it. And now they're, you know, they're firing on the ships and stuff like that. And the one guy, you know, they were talking to him and he was a, a pirate. And he said, we have to do this. He said, we have to make we have to go out there. It's life or death. Like we don't have any other options. That, so so theoretically, the best way they could probably stop the pirating is that they did. They did something to help the 
those countries help those countries on that coast, right? You know, so they don't feel like they have to go out and rob ships in order to have what they need. But still, though, it really speaks to the fact that that money doesn't buy you happiness. It doesn't buy you happiness. But as we mentioned before, money can give you the day off work so you can find out what makes you happy. That's what they can do. And here's the other thing, too. Money also changes your personality. Money changes your personality. Money can a lack of money when you really need it really can change you from a good person to a criminal. It can take change you from a responsible person to an irresponsible person if you get desperate enough. If 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 your kids are starving, I believe every single person. Please feel free to admit it. Admit it. Go and admit it. You know, if if your baby was starving and you had no money to feed that baby. I don't know about y'all, but I, I I wouldn't have no problem going to a grocery store and shoplifting to feed my kid. I, I would do it, you know. Um, and uh, and so, but but who wants to be a shoplifter? Who wants to be a thief? Who wants to do these other things? But sometimes, uh, financial strain can make us make poor decisions. You know, um, again, to not to not to, to not to overquote the great philosopher Tupac, but the uh, Tupac. You know, he he said, uh, I enjoy, I like paying rent when the rent is due. He said, I enjoy paying the rent. It, when I had money, I paid it. I paid it early. I paid it on time. But when I didn't have money, I'd have to duck and dodge the landlord because I could not afford to maintain the image of, of the person that I wanted to be. Okay. All right. And so, um, so ultimately, when you're talking about these topics, it's very important to not just talk about them, right? I think that if you want to really learn how to apply these ideas, I encourage you to do some sort of implementation. Uh, I encourage you to uh, to consciously adopt the mindset of a builder. And, uh, and and I encourage you to build something as a result of what we're discussing, right? So maybe it starts with an e-commerce business. Uh, that's one thing that we built in our family. We, 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 we have, you know, our kids are involved. All, all the kids have worked for us. I fired all the kids at least once, and then we hired them back because we, we, we don't want to give up on them. But we built the e-commerce business uh, as a way to not just apply economic principles that would allow for financial independence, but also to teach kids business in a way that was real. The best way to learn business, honestly, is when you're in business and you're making money. It's not to sit in business school where you're taking notes and, and the, you know theoretically fantasizing about what real business people do. It's better when you're actually learning, when you're actually doing it. So so I encourage you to understand what it takes to be a builder, uh, uh, sort of look at that in, in the context of your family. What things, maybe you can have a meditation with your the people around you and say, what would we build if we could build something right now? Maybe it's something as basic as a YouTube channel. You could start there. Uh, maybe it, it becomes uh, you know some other type of business that maybe it's a bakery or whatever, right? But I would think about something that you could actually create uh, my building exercise was uh, the Black Business School because I was a finance professor and I wanted my own university. And we built that. We have 162,000 students around the world and uh, and we educate them better than they received in college at a higher level because we teach them things that they don't learn in college. Uh, unfortunately, universities don't teach you to uh, run businesses or create businesses. A lot of universities just teach you how to work for businesses. And uh, and the other beautiful thing was that we were able to craft methodologies that were specific to the challenges in the Black community. So by being precise with our methods, we were able to overcome the fact that we didn't have as many resources as big institutions, but we made up for that by bringing together skilled people that could precisely hit the target. Uh, because really, when you talk about uh, Black families and Black wealth, a couple of realities that I think Black people have to accept is that number one, I I just really think you're that, that it's flawed to believe white people are going to save you. I I just don't see any evidence of that. I don't see anything out there that says that that that's a dependable solution. Um, I'm not I'm not anti integration. I'm more I'm I'm a desegregationist. Desegregation means you can integrate if you want to. But maybe you don't want to because you are stronger with people that are similar to yourself. I also would say that uh, a simple solution is that that economic intelligence must be an important part of the development of every child in any black family that wants their children to be free, happy and successful. If you want to understand the things that make you unhappy, you have to isolate that. You got to sit back and say, life is stressful. Well, why? Well, because I have to go to work every day. Uh, and I don't like it. Well, well, why? 
well, I have to go to work because I, I, I need the money. Well, why? Well, I need the money because I don't have financial security. Why? Well, because nobody in my family left me anything and nobody cared about me enough to, to make sure that I was good. Why? Well, because they were never educated on economic intelligence and nobody ever taught them the, these habits. Okay, so so what does that mean? Well, what that means is that that in this generation, this is where you break the cycle. In this generation, this is where you set a new standard. And then it's like, well, how do I do that? What do I do? Well, that's where the $5 a day plan comes into play. Blackwealthmasterplan.com. Blackwealthmasterplan.com. It's all right there. It's totally free. Uh, you can also text the word stock to 87948. I can text it to you. Text stock to 87948. Um, and literally, little amounts of money invested over a long period of time grows into a massive capital base that then allows your child to operate in the world as if they are a walking corporation. They literally... Uh, they're not looking for a job because they already have one. They're carrying their job on their back. That's sort of what happens when you have an endowment. All a corporation is, is basically a pile of resources that are allocated to achieve a specific purpose. And they hire people, they hire labor to implement the mission and the objective of the organization. So Apple's goal is to sell Apple watches and, and iPhones. So they hire people to help them do that. Well, how do they hire those people? Well, from their capital base. What is their capital base? Well, it's a bunch of stockholders who piled their money together, a bunch of debt holders who put who loan money to the company, banks and stuff like that. So they have billions of dollars, maybe a couple trillion. And they say, we're going to go hire a bunch of people to manufacture iPhones for us so that we can then make more money than we put out into the world. So, so really this same model that Apple uses to make its money can be used with your child. The difference is instead of being worth $3 trillion, your child might be worth 300,000. But the same thing you do with 3 trillion, you could do with 300,000, you just have to scale down the model. And instead of making iPhones, of course, which is hard to do, maybe they're doing something else. Maybe they're consulting, maybe they're doing artwork, maybe they're selling cookies, maybe they're they're running uh, some sort of online platform, maybe they're doing e-commerce, right? There's a lot of things you can do uh, that don't involve you having to go to work every day. The reason that you have to go to work every day is because you were an economic orphan. An economic orphan is a person who does not have a capital base. So because you don't have a capital base, you have to get um, you have to get attached to somebody else's capital base. Do you understand? You it's almost like you need a sponsor. It's almost like uh, you need a family, an economic family that's going to adopt you. And we know what happens to the adopted stepchild. The adopted stepchild always gets abused and mistreated. That's just what it is. That's just what happens. I, I remember one time when um, I was on the faculty of Syracuse. And, uh, and and the funny thing about scholars is scholars can be so petty, so petty and immature. You would think that a bunch of people with PhDs who have all this ed more, more education than 99% of the population would just be these enlightened, brilliant individuals. That's not true. We're smart. We're good at what we do. But emotionally, we can just be some some scholars can just be absolute asses. So one time we were sitting there and we were um, in a faculty meeting and we were trying to decide who we were going to hire next. So we had this guy um, uh, who was applying for a job to teach there. Now, he wasn't going to be a full faculty member like us, like where you have associates, assistants, associates and full professors and all that what they call tenure track. So, so he wasn't going to be like somebody that was like positioned at that level. He was going to come in as an adjunct. Adjuncts are just like these people you hire temporarily to work for a little while. And then they, a lot of times they go and they do something else. And also adjuncts are not seen as a part of the institution. They're not really seen as people that are going to be around a long time. It's like the difference between like, you know, maybe, maybe you have some men that maybe have the wife and the girlfriend and then the, 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 like, the, the person that's not a wife and not a girlfriend, just the fling, right? Whatever, right? And maybe women have the same hierarchy. I have no idea, right? I'm not a woman. But anyway, so adjuncts are kind of like the fling, right? They're like, okay, we have no long-term plans for you. You're just here to fulfill a temporary need. You are the adopted stepchild. That's what you are. You're the adopted stepchild. So what does that mean? Well, what that means is that uh, when you get hired, we were sitting in this meeting, literally, this guy, he was going to make half the money that we made and, and then on top of that, he was going to do twice as much teaching as we did. He was going to do all the teaching for half the money, literally. And uh, and we, we just sat there and we were, we were, and, and then people started making funny jokes about him. 
and saying stuff like, like, yeah, well, you know, maybe we can get them to sweep the floor too, <laughs> or get them to clean my office. You know, like just, just being bullies, just being jerks. Like it was just terrible. I was sitting in that meeting. I was laughing too. I ain't gonna lie. But anyway, my point is to say that that's what happens when you're the adopted stepchild. The adopted stepchild gets all the garbage work. They don't get the respect. They don't get the resources. They sort of get sort of tossed in there to just that you better do what we tell you to do. Uh, this is what has happened to black people. This is what ha has happened to black people. A um, couple areas I'm thinking about. Number one is uh, with these corporations that were built by people outside of your community who have nothing, who don't care about you, who don't, you know, don't really don't really want you around. They don't really like you. They just kind of tolerate you. Right. And they bring you in and they're like, you better do what we say, no matter how much we pay you. I mean, think about this. Give me a yes or no. Give me a yes or no. Are black people more likely to be paid less than other people? Yes or no? Taraji, Taraji said it. Taraji's world famous, but she was complaining about her pay, right? Monique was complaining about, complaining about her pay, right? So black people get paid less. Uh, we we get the worst kinds of work. Uh, we get the work that nobody else wants to do, right? And this happens. Why? Well, because you're an economic orphan. You're an economic orphan who's desperate. You're begging. You're begging. See, when you come in desperate and begging, like the, the, this is what this guy was doing. He was coming in. We knew we knew he had nowhere to go. When we were going to hire, we knew he had nowhere to go. He was an adjunct. Adjuncts, there are adjunct PhDs out here, I kid you not, that are making less money than minimum wage. There are adjuncts out here. Go look it up. Go look up like the, the pay, pay rate of adjunct professors. You would think that with PhDs, they would be getting paid more. No, no. They, they, they just do. They just crap all over them, right? Why? Well, because they got nowhere to go. It's not like the guy was going to say, screw you, I'm going to leave. No, it's like, well, you ain't going to get no job like, like Syracuse University out here, so you can go if you want to, but we got 500 applicants for that little crappy job that you're complaining about, so you bet not say nothing. You bet not say nothing, right? That's what That was his reality. That's what I remember seeing, and that what make, that's what makes me think about the experience of being Black. When you don't have an economic base, pay attention now. When you don't have an economic base, you're showing up as a beggar with your cup in your hand. Sir, can I can I get two pence, please, sir? And they're like, well, where's your mama? Where's your daddy? Where's your family at? I have no family, sir. Or they they did nothing for me. They made no plan for me. They gave me no, no economic base, so I need what you have. And then they're like, well, you know you're a nigger, right? You know that we don't like you people. And they, I'm just kidding. I'm being facetious but you know what i'm talking about don't forgive me for i'm being silly but really they're like well you know we don't like people like you and then you're like okay no 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 but I'll, I'll do anything i'll do anything like just i'll do anything for any rate of pay and you have no options right you have no ability to say no and so because of that you have no bargaining power you know you have no leverage and then they give you the lowest pay and give you the worst jobs and then you end up miserable has anybody ever heard of something called Project 100,000? They don't just do it in corporate America. They do it in the military, too. Has anybody ever heard of Project 100,000? Secretary McNamara did this during the, the Vietnam War. Okay, Project 100,000. I learned about this from a, uh, a white history professor uh, in, at the University of Kentucky. Really great guy. G gave excellent lectures. He was a really interesting person to listen to. Project 100,000 was where they said, okay, this Vietnam War, which we're fighting because we just want to make money. A lot of wars are about money now. You know, I respect the soldiers, but I don't respect the government in terms of why they go to war. Sometimes they go to war for stupid reasons. Um, nobody wants to go fight in Vietnam anymore because they're seeing their friends come back with their legs blown off and and PTSD and drug addictions and all this. They, they don't want to go. Right. And they definitely don't want to be in infantry because they're seeing the video of how terrible it is in infantry. So they said, you know. Let's go get the black people. Let's go get black guys because we can get them to do it. And so what they did was they created Project 100,000 where they said, we're going to go and we're going to take advantage of the low opportunities and the low self-esteem of black people to get them to go fight this war that we don't want to fight. You know, and, and so we're not going to go after the Muhammad Ali types. That's why Muhammad Ali was so dangerous, because he was going around saying, I'm not fighting your war. And Viet Cong ain't never called me nigga, all that. Right. So he he was up here in terms of self-esteem. But you had a lot of people where they could go sit down in the living room with your mother and with in the nice uniform and say, look, we're going to take your son. We're going to give him all these skills. 
We're going to make him an asset to the community. And when he comes back home, he's going to get a great job because we're going to train him on how to, you know, fix tanks and, and all this other stuff. And he'll be able to do all these great things, right? When he gets out, right? Like that. And so think about this, right? So the mother's feeling good. And she's like, yeah, that would be good for my son because he's out in these streets. Ain't nothing for him to do. Because again, he's got no economic base. So it's like, yeah, okay. And the military, right? Because they got the government money. So they're writing a big check. They'll give you that big old signing bonus, you know, whatever, where you can buy that car, right? So you go into the, they, they, so these guys were going into the military under the expectation that they were going to just level up, that they was a, eyes is, eyes, eyes is important now, mama, right? They, that's what it was. It was like, you get, we're, we're accepting you now. Cause remember the military, there was a time where they didn't even want black people in the military. Then they realized that we're, we're great soldiers. We're great fighters. Right. So they started to change that. So, 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 so they've accepted us. And we're happy because getting accepted by them is so important to us because we've never accepted ourselves. We need their validation. So they went into the military under Project 100,000 where they were promised to get all these skills and all these other things. And what the plan was actually was to throw them straight into infantry, just throw them straight on the front lines in the places nobody else wanted to go. And so many black men got killed during Project 100,000. Tens of thousands of black men died came home with uh, crippled, came home addicted to heroin. My father came home addicted to heroin. Uh, you know, he, he just fought off the heroin addiction. I had two, I had a, a step, I have a stepfather that raised me and a biological father. Both of them were addicted to drugs. One of them couldn't get away from the drugs. The other one did. Right. But this was, this was real. And this is, this is the part of the breakdown of the black family, right? Cause all your men are being destroyed in this way. Right. So, so, so then, you know, then you move forward to the era of mass incarceration, everything else. So the black male gets wiped out. Right. So, so the thing about project 100,000, and I was thinking about this because it was one of those things that where, where, where I think that we were kind of manipulated because I, in a way where, if we had options for our kids, if we were if we were thinking about this and creating these capital bases that we talk about, not to blame the people at that time, because maybe they didn't know what, what we're talking about today. They didn't know these things. But a lot of that could be avoided. Right. So when you when you make your child an economic orphan, they become vulnerable to the exploitation of others. Right. And, and Project 100,000 just makes me sad because. Uh, because a lot of us end up in situations where we don't know who we are, or where we're supposed to be. And then somebody else grabs us and has us doing their dirty work, has us doing that dirty job, has us in a situation that we don't want to be in. I had a really great department chair at Syracuse named Peter Covios. He was one of the nicest people in the world. He was one of the few people who understood why I was so racially outspoken. Nobody else in the department understood it. Everybody else thought it was just a bunch of crazy talk. He really got it. And I remember I sat down with this man uh, who was from Greece and he told me about when he was in the military. And he said that I wrote he said I wrote a letter to them because I noticed that in my unit where we were training, they kept sending all the black guys to Vietnam. He said they weren't sending the white guys. They kept sending the black guys. He said, so I wrote a letter to them saying this is racism. Like, why would you do that? But of course, it's America. Why wouldn't you send the black guys to die first? Their lives are less valuable. Black lives really don't matter, right? So so really, um, my, my argument is this, and I'm, I'm going to close the loop on this. After Actually, as we lay out our last uh, our last point here, and make sure, make sure you copy all this down because uh, I'm, I'm going to leave it up here for a couple minutes. The last part, the last effect of financial insecurity is physical health. Financial stress can work worse than your physical health, which can also affect your mental health, right? Um, or your mental well-being. So basically, we know that financial insecurity not only can cause you to put yourself in terrible situations where things get worse because you're an economic orphan and nobody left you anything, right? And we're not going to do that to our kids, but it can also cause anxiety and stress, lots of depression, problems with relationships like the broken black family, impaired decision making like i'm gonna go get a gun and rob this liquor store because i don't have any money and then physical health effects uh this is why black men die younger than everybody else this is all connected the economic racism is directly connected to the negative health outcomes for black males in this country so if you have a black male that you love a son brother cousin whatever you should probably share this with them so they'll understand okay if i get my money right I'm really not just getting my money right. I'm really getting everything right. right? I'm getting my, my mind right. I'm getting my body right. All these things are connected, right? It's very hard in America to be mentally and physically healthy and also be broke 
at the same time. That 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 doesn't even. It, I mean, unless you're just, you know, if you have a magical superpower that nobody else has, where somehow you don't have to pay bills, then God bless you for that. But for most people, financial security is connected to their physical and mental health. And one of the biggest mistakes that people make when it comes to establishing financial security is they believe it has to be done by each person in each generation for themselves, right? They they, they think, okay, if I want financial security, it, the way I get it is I wait till I'm 25 and have nothing. And then I start doing things like the fire movement. I start, you know, what was fun, fun, fire movement? It's um financial, uh, financial something, uh, retire early financial. Is it not financial investing? It's something fin financial, something retire early. I can't remember what the I stands for. Y'all got to help me. Uh, but anyway, but so so they start, you know, saving and, and investing and learning about money and finances and all that. And that's cool. Like, there's nothing wrong with that. But the problem with that is that financial independence. Thank you, Christian. Uh, financial independence retire early. I like the fire movement. It's a great it's great as a last resort. It's great if you didn't do anything before that. It's great if nobody made a plan for you. It's great if that's all you got. But that ain't how big boy economics works, people. That's not how big boy economics works. The way big boy, big girl economics works is it's not some 25-year-old with nothing who scrambles and takes crappy jobs and gets by however they can to the point where they can eventually hopefully save and scrimp a little bit of something as they're paying off their student loans and, and spending another 10, 15 years without investing in anything and owning no real estate, no property. And then maybe by the time they're 65, they're good. That's not how it's supposed to work. The way it's supposed to work is that somebody's supposed to pay it forward for you. Somebody's supposed to start the work before you arrive. If I, in my personal meditation this weekend, I've told you guys this, my personal meditation the last three days has been, I've been watching war documentaries. I watched an entire documentary about World War II, which is, I've, I've probably seen it two or three times. And then I watched a really deep documentary about Pearl Harbor and the attack on Pearl Harbor. And one of the things that I really picked up on is I said, if you're really trying to win a battle, typically the team that prepares the most is going to win. If you prepare the most and you prepare earliest, it's going to be so hard for the opposition to catch up with you. If you catch the opposition off guard and they're not ready and you are, there's no catch. There's no, they have no chance. You know, so the Americans in Pearl Harbor had no chance. They weren't ready. They were sleeping in on a Sunday morning. The Japanese have been preparing this attack for 18 months. Hey, hundreds of planes are coming over, bombing every specific location where your battleships and aircraft carriers are located in your airfields. Oh, so you run out and you're running out in your pajamas trying to jump in an airplane because you see the Japanese place, but you get to the airfield and all the airplanes are already blown up because they were not just prepared to attack you. They were prepared for your counterattack. They were they said you, first thing you're going to do is try to get in an airplane, so we're going to blow up all your airplanes. So you'll be sitting on the ground praying in your pajamas cuz you you have no you have no win at that point. So preparation really is the key to success. I've always said that to the kids, but I meditate on the ideas that I have just to see if I understand them properly and I apply them to as many contexts as possible just to really try to understand it. And so I, I came up with this model. I like acronyms. They help me remember things. And I said, okay, I get it. Here's how you win a war. It's it's, it's what I call the DIP model. I like to make little acronym models that, that help capture ideas. So the DIP model, it's D-I-I-I-I, -I -I -I, four I's, P, DIP, right? The D stands for discipline, right? If you ain't got no discipline, you will not win. If you don't have discipline financially on some level, it ain't got to be high level discipline. It's got to be something that you're willing to do once a week, once a day, once a month, once a whatever that's going to have, that's going to prepare you for the long term win. You have to have some type of discipline. You have something, you have to have something that you're doing in a disciplined fashion that's going to get you ready for the future because the future is always coming. The future is going to get here. 2030 is coming. 2040 is coming. Right. So so the D stands for discipline. The I, the four I's, and I was applying this mostly to warfare, but it was like information. Th these are the things that seem to help win the war. Information, innovation and infinite industrialization. Information. 
having information about like cracking Japanese codes and 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 different tac different battle tactics and stuff like that was really important. Uh, innovation, right? The ability to develop radar to be able to figure out when the planes were coming that was important. So you had your scientists working around the clock. So being innovative and creative is was important. Uh, you know, like building. You know, like so the response to the Pearl Harbor thing was. Hiroshima, right? That was the, the atomic bomb. And we had to rush to innovate the atomic bomb because other people were trying to build their own atomic bombs, right? So, you know, it, not to say I, I didn't like it. I don't like anything about Hiroshima. But at the same time, it's like, what if that had happened in Chicago? Or what if that happened in New York, right? So, so there's innovation um, and then infinite industrialization. The way the United States was able to dominate World War II and the reason we we changed the tide because the Germans were kicking everybody's butt in Europe. The Europeans just they don't have they don't I don't think they had what Americans had. Americans are fighters um, that we had industrialization. We, we just were able to mass produce anything that we wanted. We were able to mass produce thousands of ships and tanks and guns and bullets and whatever. Like we mass produce whatever we wanted, right? So so the four eyes are information, innovation, infinite industrialization, right? So so what I thought about with the black community was I said, I said, okay, so if a family wants to win, if they've got discipline, right? You're doing say the five, 10, $20 a day plan and you're disciplined about it. You're investing the money in the S&P 500 index fund and your blackwealthmasterplan.com. If you're not sure how to do this, blackwealthmasterplan.com. So you're consistently investing that money. You're letting that money grow. Um, you have information, you're, you're learning, you're, you're, you're getting financial literacy on a regular basis, right? Uh, so, you know, different ways to achieve your goals, innovation, you're creatively thinking about your environment, how you can apply the things, you know, to figure out how to, how your family can generate more income, right? Maybe you're sitting around brainstorming, like hmm, with all this financial literacy that we're learning, what's a business we can start? What's an investment we can make? Maybe we go to, uh, you know, there, there is a, we have, we have a whole training, how to make money without working. It's on boycewalkins.com. If you want to take a look at that, or if you text the word stock to eight, seven, nine, four, eight, I can send that to you. Right. So maybe that innovation and information they work together right because now that i've got financial literacy i can i i by sitting and obsessing about it i creatively tap into our natural genius that comes from a collective thinking process that allows us to figure out creative ways to to elevate our economic situation right so so that's where the innovation comes in and then infinite industrialization here's where that comes into the black community in my opinion I believe that for black people collectively to succeed and to 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 dominate our own space we have to mass produce the types of children that we want to see. We have to mass produce financially intelligent children the same way you mass produce Teslas or 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 tanks or or guns or whatever, right? I think we got to mass produce because what's happening now is they're already mass producing certain kinds of black people in America. They do. They mass produce football and basketball players through these little camps, these systems. They have systems where they identify children early that are talented athletes and they mass produce football and basketball players. They mass produce thugs. There's a whole documentary called The Nigga Factory you should go check out where they literally mass produce thug-like behavior. Snoop Dogg said it when he was talking to Tupac and he was warning Tupac about putting out the song Hit Him Up because he said that's going to cause us problems. And Tupac said, no, we're, we're, we're the guys. Like, like, like everybody's afraid of us. As Snoop said, no, they they make us everywhere. He said they manufacture. He, he said manufacture, but he said they he said because they make us everywhere. You know, he said we're, we're mass produced. We're everywhere, right? Why? Well, because of the systematic proliferation of media, right? Owned by certain companies pushing the same messages all throughout the country. So next thing you know, you got thugs in every city, right? You got guys in every city that dress the same, act the same, whatever, right? Same thing. So so they mass produce the types of black people they want to see. It's time for us to mass produce the types of black people we want to see. Do you understand? Like we have to do that. We have to have systematic protocols of saying like, okay, our children have to have basic financial literacy so that every single child that comes out of our community, comes out of the B1 space, is go they're going to be ready. They're going to have options. They're going to know what's going on. We're going to endow them. We're preparing to win the battle in the year 2053. That's what we're doing. We're preparing for 2043. That's what we're doing. That's what we're doing right now. Okay, so what does the P stand for? Uh, the P, uh, what did the P stand for? The P, there was a P. Um, oh, crap. Uh, oh, no, gosh. What was the P? I, I'm mad. I'm mad at myself. Um, the P. I can't remember what the P stood for. 
I got to go back and find it. I'm so sorry, guys. Forgive me. I know I did have an elder moment, right, Calvin? You're, you're so right. Yeah, it's it's not, it's something else. It's something else. It's not perseverance. That's That would be a great P. Let's right now assume it's perseverance, right? I, it's not perseverance, though. It's not because it was, it was specific to studying war and what it took to win. Oh, I know. I got it now. It comes back to, it came back to me. Yes. Why did I forget this? Preparation. Preparation. And I've said that to you. I've said that. How many times have I said preparation is the key to success? When you see two people standing next to each other and one guy has 10 million in his bank account and the other guy has nothing. Do you think he got that $10 million last week? Or when you see two football teams uh, play against each other and one team beats the other, like Georgia beats uh, Florida State, you know, 53 to three. Do you think that Georgia started practicing last week? No, Georgia was prepared. They've been accumulating this powerhouse football team over years. It started three, four years ago when they were recruiting the players that are on the field right now, when they were in the weight room nine months ago. They were preparing at a higher level, and that's why they literally railroaded and ran straight over Florida State. My wife went to Florida State, by the way. So, so effectively, that preparation piece is critical to understanding wealth. It is impossible to have wealth if you did not prepare to have it. It is impossible for you to be economically strong in America, damn near impossible, if somebody did not prepare you for battle. If somebody, if, if nobody prepared, you know, and, and what does preparation look like in a family that, that's, that's really trying to do this the right way? Preparation for really wealthy people starts multiple generations ahead. It, it starts, it, like, if you're if you're preparing right now, like, if you're making a commitment right now, give me a yes. If, if it, Hopefully, I persuaded you. I hope I persuaded you a little more. Let me know if I have. I, I want to feel like I did something good today before I get on my airplane. Um, if you're preparing right now, what you got to understand is that that the that what you're doing right now is preparing, is preparing you for the year 2029, 2032. That's what you're really preparing for. It doesn't mean you won't see benefits this year or next year, but you're really preparing for five, six, seven years down the line. Like, like for example, somebody who made a ton of money off Apple stock was preparing back in 2018. They started buying Apple stock consistently, and now their money has three, three X, four X. They started buying Bitcoin consistently in 2018. Now they're looking at all kinds of money that they've spent that they've been investing into Bitcoin. Okay, do you understand, right? <clears throat> but, but really, the 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 thing about preparation is that it's preparation is the cousin of accumulation. And all wealth is, is accumulation. So wealth, accumulation, preparation, WAP, to quote Cardi B, right? <laughs> so you get that WAP, right? Wealth comes from an accumulation, all an accumulation. What is that? That's like an accumulation of snow. It's a bunch of little efforts that add up to create something big. What is wealth? What does it mean when you see a rich person? How do you know that they're rich? Well, you're, you know that they're rich because they have a lot of stuff. I got a Lamborghini and a mansion and and I own 25 properties and I have a million dollars in the bank. Wow, you're rich. Well, what are you really saying? You're saying, oh, you have an accumulation. You've accumulated lots of assets, which makes you wealthy. Well, how did you do the accumulation? Well, you didn't do it last night. You did the same thing over a long period of time and it piled up. So you prepared, you, you were preparing long ago for the moment that we're standing in right now. You see, in, in Sun Tzu, in the art of war, he says that battles are won before they begin. And what he's basically saying is that preparation is the key to success. And the reason I break, I emphasize that point to you, and I need you to write that down and think that through carefully and meditate on this, is because I don't believe that our community is trains itself to be prepared for things. I just don't. I don't believe preparation is interesting to people. I believe that people sit around and wait for something bad to happen so they can have another pity party. And then when times are good and you say, hey, let's prepare, let's prepare because you might lose that job. Let's save that money because, because you might have some economic hard times. 
People don't want to do that. Why? Well, because it feels good to just go to the club and party and whatever, right? Well, why are you doing that? Well, maybe because you're doing all these coping mechanisms because you're so stressed out about being black that you don't really want to think about your 401k. You want to take that money and go buy some scratch-offs. Remember that episode of Black Jeopardy on SNL where Leslie Jones, they, they said, the question was, um, if you're black and your boss wants you to put an extra $50 in your 401k, what do you do? And she said... You better give me my $50 so I can buy me some scratch offs. So what she's basically saying is, is, is she's pro they're promoting the idea that if you're black, you're so obsessed with instant gratification that you're not preparing for anything. You're not prepared because 401k, putting money in the 401k is a preparation met methodology that that thousands of people use to become millionaires by the time they retire. And then they pass that money down to their kids and their kids are millionaires when they're bored. So so, so this is easy. It's very straightforward. But the question is, you got the extra $50 that you can put at the 401k. What are you going to do with it? Well, a lot of people are going to say that you should go and buy you the scratch offs or you should go to the casino boat or you should go uh, and buy you some liquor or you should go out and party or you should go do something else. And so what I'm saying to you is that that preparation piece is critical when it comes to the accumulation process, which is necessary for you to have wealth. So you must understand all these things because what all wealth is really is it's like driving down a big, long road. It's like drive. if we all got in the car and just drove west, it, let's say the richest people are the ones who have driven the furthest. They're the ones who are the furthest west. Well, typically all that means is that these people have been driving longer than everybody else. If everybody's car kind of goes the same speed, with little variations, the person who's the furthest down, the wealthiest person, is just the person who's been doing doing this longer than other people. Kobe Bryant, when Kobe Bryant talked about what it took to be a great basketball player, that's what he talked about the accumulation process. He, he it was very subtle. A lot of people missed it, but here's what he was saying: He was really talking about something that could be easily be applied to wealth. He said, "If you are my competitor and you practice every day, you get up at ten o'clock and you work out." And then you go and do what you're going to do for the rest of the day. But I get up at 4 a.m. and I work out and then I eat and I rest and then I come back and work out again. I'm getting two workouts a day. You're only getting one. So if you add that process up, if we do that every day, 300 days a year, let's say for 10 years, then literally I've gotten 3000 more workouts than you which means you I, you can't be a better basketball player than me because I have accumulated 3,000 more workouts than you have. So I'm uh, I'm wealthy basketball-wise. I'm going to show up on the day of the competition prepared at a level that you cannot match, sir. You cannot match me because I've got 3,000 extra workouts of experience that you do not have. And this is how wealth works too. It's really that simple. And imagine though, but imagine if Kobe was able to pass those workouts down to his children, right? This is the thing about wealth. Not only can you benefit from the accumulation yourself, but you pass that down to your child. Your child's starting here. Everybody else's kids are starting here. So why don't we make it easy for them? Why would we subject our children and our grandchildren to child abuse? Why would we do that to them? All we need is a little bit of discipline and a little bit of preparation, and everything changes. All those things that I mentioned, all the anxiety, the depression, the stress, the, the physical symptoms, all these other things that come from a result of financial insecurity, go away. I don't know about y'all, but that's what I want for my kids. I want them to be happy. I don't want them to sit around sad about how hard it is to be black. That's not the future that I'm building for them. Because my goal is to be a decent man in my life in that way. So that's it. Thank you guys for hanging out. I hope this was beneficial. Uh, we're going to meet tomorrow for our next financial reflection. Uh, if you want to get um, uh, I don't some stuff sent to you, the $5 day plan, all that stuff, a list of AI stocks you can invest in. Uh, make sure you text the word stock to 87948. Uh, just text stock to 87948. 
Uh, also, if you go to um, drboyceelevate.com, drboyceelevate.com, you can get recordings of all these trainings that we've done up until this point. And also you can have a copy of the slides and everything else. So, uh, and then uh, also we have financial flashcards and workbooks and stuff like that for kids. If you want to take a look at that, you can go to drboycebooks.com. That's drboycebooks.com. And of course, boycewalkins.com. There's a lot of stuff there too. All right. So God bless you guys. It was real. It was fun. Let me go get ready to get on this airplane. I will see y'all tomorrow. Take care now. Bye-bye.